Yes, indeed. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk about impurity uh, solvers. So now the key will be to try to find different methods to, to solve the impurity solver. Uh, actually, I will tell you about three uh, ways to solve the impurity problem. Two of them are really uh, cheap and uh, approximate, but they're nevertheless quite useful. Uh, plus, you will certainly use both of them uh, during the tutorial uh, tomorrow and the days after that. So, so I'll uh, introduce these two. And then uh, the, the, the bigger one uh, will be the CTQMC interaction expansion uh, algorithm. So I'll spend more time uh, explaining this. So to give you some courage, uh, in general, the, the more, I mean, the more uh, characters uh, in a name, the more complicated. So I'll start with something which is called Hubbard 1. So this is basically just one. So this will be the easy one. And I'll switch to something which is called IPT, three characters. No, this is still, uh, still OK. And then things get a little more uh, difficult with CTQMC, you see, so we're switching to, to five. But to give you some courage here, uh, you'll learn about uh, LDA plus the MFT. So you see, uh, it's still quite easy what we're doing here. Uh, so. And the other thing is there will be coffee breaks. So actually, before introducing the CTQMC, I'll tell you a little more about Monte Carlo on very generic grounds. Uh, so I'll start from here, basically explain Monte Carlo, start quantum. And here somewhere we'll have coffee, okay? So, you know, <laughs> keep that in mind so then uh, it gives you maybe a little bit of courage. So uh, I just want to restart, restate a couple of things that were said already, uh, just maybe to remind the DMFT uh, idea and the self-consistency uh, to really show you where the impurity solver enters and what we really want from this uh, impurity solver. So DMFT. So I'm not reintroducing what Antoine already said, but uh, very quickly, the idea is we start from a lattice model and we map this on a problem of a single impurity or an embedded atom which talks to some, you can think of it as a conduction best, which has a given structure, okay? And these two things communicate through a hopping, a hybridization, and there's locally here, an Hamiltonian which describes the local physics, okay? So uh, the key is that this part here, uh, I'll take the example of the Hubbard model. You have to know that actually, I mean, you can do the DMFT map for other models than the Hubbard model, okay? But for, uh, to be, I mean, in this, in this case, I'll focus on the Hubbard model. And in that case, the model uh, it maps on two is the Anderson impurity model. So I'll show you both the Hamiltonian formulation and the action uh, formulation of this problem you've seen uh, both, but this is just a reminder. So the Hamiltonian for the Anderson impurity model has these local terms here. So there's a local energy, some epsilon d, some over the spins of some d dagger sigma d sigma. This is the local energy of your level. There's the repulsion u and the up and the down. And then there's the hybridization and the energy of the best. So there's one part which is sum over k, say, and sigma, epsilon k sigma, c dagger k sigma, c k sigma. So this is just the dispersion of your best here. And there's the hybridization, which is sum over k and sigma of some v k sigma. I'll call it d dagger sigma c k sigma, and there's the emission conjugate. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian formulation of the uh, Anderson impurity model. The other formulation, so this is the Hamiltonian point of view. You can also look at it uh, from the point of view of the action. So describe basically the impurity by its action. And in that case, the action for the Anderson impurity model <coughs> is written as an integral over two imaginary times. So Vijay introduced this of some d dagger times tau, then enters the g0 here, minus one, the tau minus tau prime, d tau prime. This is what is describing basically the non-interacting system. So this is basically the action for the impurity if there were no local correlation. And then there's a, a, an extra term here which describes the Coulomb repulsion, which is some u integral of d tau 
Oh, sorry, here I miss my spin indices. So there's an extra sum sorry, here for the sigma of n of tau and on d tau. So this describes the repulsion. Okay? So basically, what encodes the structure of the best here is this in the Hamiltonian formalism is epsilon k, vk, and epsilon d and u. This is what characterizes the system. Okay? In the action case, everything is encoded in this g0. So you saw that g0, I'll write it in frequency, in Matsubara frequency here, g0 of i omega n. The inverse is i omega n, oh, sorry, minus epsilon d minus some hybridization function i omega n, which is given, so this Antoine showed. Oh, sorry, this should be this way. And sum over k and sigma, vk sigma squared divided by i omega n minus epsilon k sigma. So you see that the ingredients that define G0 are epsilon k, vk, and epsilon d. Okay? The point I'm trying to make here is that the knowledge of G0 essentially is the same thing as having the knowledge of epsilon d, vk, and epsilon k. So these two things are really uh, equivalent. So the DMFT self-consistency, you'll see, is something which essentially provides G0, but keep in mind that this is actually the same as setting the parameters that appear here here and basically here. Okay? So I talked about the MFT self-consistency, so I'll, I'll write it down. And so the DMFT self-consistency is basically a loop. So you basically want to enforce the fact that the Green's function of the impurity, which is uh, a Green's function of, a, of this local impurity here, <coughs> is the same thing as the local lattice Green's function. So you want to, to enforce that the impurity Green's function, G imp, say I omega n, is the same thing as the local sum over k, GK of I omega n of the lattice Green's function. Okay? And the lattice Green's function is 1 over I omega n minus epsilon k minus well, I should ask poten chemical potential minus the self-energy. So here, in principle, I would put the lattice self-energy, which is an object which has both k and frequency dependence. But within the DMFT approximation, this object here loses its k dependent, as Antoine said. And I replace it by the impurity self-energy, which only has frequency dependence. Okay? So you see, I have an equation which basically relates the impurity self-energy to the impurity Green's function. So this is all in impurity world. So in principle, I can try to find a way uh, to find the solution. And the way you do this is you do a self-consistency loop. You start with the guess for G0 of the impurity. You plug this in, and this is where the impurity solver comes in. So you have some machine, some impurity solver which solve the Anderson impurity model. So it, either using the action or the Hamiltonian, depending on the method, it will solve the impurity problem. And what you ask from this guy is to give you the self-energy. This is what you need, basically. So you add this guy to give you the impurity self-energy. Okay, having this, I can now plug this self-energy in the self-consistency equation here and extract a new <coughs> impurity G. So what you get? is the G impurity, which is, I'll just write it, sum over K, sigma impurity. So we're almost done. Here I've used the DMFT self-consistency condition. Now in order to get a new G0 here, I use Dyson's equation essentially. So I get a new G0 impurity. This is minus one, sorry, little small which is G, the one that I have here, impurity minus one plus sigma impurity. I hope it's not too small. And now you have a new G0, you plug it in and you loop. Okay? 
It's a little too small. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll make it bigger. Uh, OK, so basically what you need to know here is what you ask from your impurity solver is get a self-energy, use the self-consistency condition, and get a new G0. And then you just loop. So this is the DMFT loop. OK? So now if you're interested in uh, different models, which are not just the Hubbard model. So for the Hubbard model, the Anderson impurity model here is a single orbital Anderson impurity model, right? If you're doing realistic materials, your origin model is something which has more orbitals. We have 5D orbitals or more, okay? So in that case, the Anderson impurity model has also five orbitals, okay? The point is that the local Hamiltonian on the lattice and on uh, the Anderson impurity model is the same. So what you're asking for your ideal impurity solver is, first of all, that it's exact, uh, that it deals both strong coupling, low coupling, both high temperature, low temperature, that it gives you results on the real frequency axis, that it can deal with many orbitals and with any Hamiltonian. Of course, the problem is there is no such solver. There is no solver that can provide all of these informations. So this is why we're presenting different solvers here. Actually, you will see that different impurity solvers are good at different things. Okay? But at least the dream is uh, what I just said. So until here, are there any, any questions? Uh, because uh, this is pretty much setting the stage, so I would like to be sure that this far everything makes sense. Yes, in, 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 pre yes. in, in practice, uh, it turns out yeah, that you can essentially start with any G0 uh, and plug it in the purity solver, and this actually converges. Of course, if you have a smarter guess, the thing will converge faster. Uh, but, uh, but in principle, you don't need to have a, a very good guess for the beginning. calculate G0 by from the parameters that you have in the system or is it just a function that you put in? Well, it, actually this depends on the solver you're going to use. So uh, there are solvers that are based directly on the action. So some solvers are directly uh, based on this formulation here. And in that case, just the knowledge of S of G0, sorry, as a function of imaginary time is enough. And this is what the solver will use. In some other uh, cases, for example, when you use exact diagonalization, you get G0 as a function, but then you sort of fit this function by trying to find which are the parameters, epsilon k, vk, epsilon d, that actually reproduce this imaginary time function. And then you can go back to Hamiltonian formulation and solve this with Hamiltonian-based tools like uh, exact diagonalization or Energy. So you are not taking what? the form that we, that is written here, that 1 by i omega n minus epsilon d delta? No, there's no way one can really use this directly in, an, in a Hamiltonian-based form, because this is depending on, on time somehow. So no, in that case, you have to go back uh, to the Hamiltonian formulation here. So what is the use of this formula? Where would it be used? The last second last part. What yeah, you mean this? this? Oh, oh, you mean why I did not write everything in uh, imaginary time? I mean, this is just the Fourier transform of this function, right? Yeah, no, I'm saying in the self-consistency process. In the self-consistency process, you in general work uh, in Matsubara frequencies because equations are diagonal in frequency. No, I'm saying uh, where will this form? That means it's the delta would be important. Well, the, the, the delta appears indirectly here. So when I redefine a new G0, mm -hmm. this somehow redefined a, a different hybridization function. Thomas, you want to add something? Uh, if I understand the question right, the delta you would basically need if you want to do calculations using NRG uh, because that's the object hybridization function that enters directly into this Hamiltonian formulation uh, or uh, with Philip Werner's uh, hybridization expansion that also is built around this delta. Yes. So in his case, he doesn't need it, but in other cases, you might need it. Okay, yeah. Oh, if you were asking about the delta, yes, uh, sometimes. Keep in mind that, uh, I mean, G zero and delta is exactly the same thing. It, it contains exactly the same information. So if you write this the self-consistency loop in terms of G0 impurity is the new input or delta is the new input, it's exactly the same information because it's connected by this one equation. So whatever you write, you do the same thing. Well, to call it an impurity solver is, 
a lot. Actually, this is uh, an approximation which has been introduced by Hubbard in, uh, in the 60s, I think 64. And uh, the idea is to make something really extremely simple uh, as a starting point. And basically, the point is to have an approximation of your Anderson impurity model in which I just simply neglect all the baths. So I completely neglect these two terms. So basically, I, this is a completely an atomic limit. So it's an approximation in which the Hamiltonian for the Anderson impurity model is just given by uh, this epsilon d sum over sigma d dagger sigma d sigma plus the interaction term u and up d and down d. This is the approximation. So we see it's extremely simple. Uh, I just consider the isolated atom. And from this, I extract a self-energy for the impurity, which is basically this atomic self-energy. Okay. So in that very simple uh, one level case, uh, one could write the, this uh, self-energy directly. Of course, it's more used in the context of realistic materials where at least the local Hamiltonian has several bands, maybe uh, also not just a local U, but also a Hund's term and so on. So in that case, all you do, you take that local Hamiltonian and you diagonalize it. Either you can do it by hand, or if you can, then you just use a LAPAC or any a numerical subroutine. And from this, compute the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian, and then you're able to get the self-energy. So this is extremely simple. Okay? But of course, it completely neglects uh, the best. Nevertheless, where do you think this kind of approximation could make some sense? In what regime of parameters? Where do you think this might be actually useful? Sorry? E is very small, like it's. Exactly. When V is very small with respect to U, so basically either when U is big, so when my state is something which looks like an insulator. So this is actually uh, not as bad in the insulator, for example. Or because it's somehow the same limit, also at very high temperature. So high temperature. So these are two cases where this approximation is maybe not that bad, especially maybe it's not that bad a starting point. So sometimes you can use this as an approximation to get a first indeed guess uh, for your self-energy and as such of your G0 in the DMFT equations. And then on top of this, you do something more sophisticated. But obviously, it's very bad if you really go in the metallic state or if you, can, if you want to look at low T. Okay, this, in general, is not the place where you want to use this approximation. Okay. So it's mainly so that you know that it exists and uh, we'll use it during the tutorial. So, so this is really an easy one. Uh, now we can do so, something slightly more sophisticated, uh, which is called the iterated perturbation theory, which is also probably historically one of the first solvers that has been used. So you, you'll see it in the literature as IPT, iterated perturbation theory. And here the principle is extremely simple again, is you write your self-energy simply to second order perturbation theory. Okay. So it's in, maybe I should say in U, just to make things clear. Okay. So you write the self energy to second order perturbation in U. And this is something which so this is my impurity self energy. So I'll give you the solution here. It's something which looks like U over two. And I'll mention something more, plus u squared. So you see, it's up to second order in u. There's an integral in imaginary time d tau from 0 to beta, e to the minus i no, so, uh, plus i omega n tau. So uh, yeah, so let me. So this is the self energy expressed in Matsubara frequency, just to make things clear. And here you'll put g0 of tau to the cube. Okay, so this is the G0, the input of the impurity solver. As a function of G0, this is the expression of the self-energy to second order. Okay. So it's a very simple calculation uh, to do. So for those of you, well, one thing which I need to add here is that this approximation, IPT, 
at least the way I present it here, is focused and have feeling. Okay? Feeling, uh, even though it's not ambiguous here at have feeling, when you're away from have feeling, there are, in principle, different ways you might want to write your IPT. So there it's, uh, it's not completely uh, well defined. Uh, in the code? In the code? Yes. Uh, do you have an IPT no. I mean, the IPT solver is so simple to write that you just write it like this. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's here, so you just write it. So it, there's no need. No, no, we, no, no, I haven't, no, we don't have the generalized version. Something. I'll, I'll first comment on what happens at have feeling already. Uh, and then, yeah, then I'll comment uh, on, on that. So just for, for those of you, just out of curiosity, who knows about diagrams, Feynman diagrams in perturbation theory, just to have a little. Uh, Thomas, I guess <laughs> you knew a little bit. Okay. So, so, well, so for those of you who know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's one little thing I forgot to mention, so sorry. This is actually not exactly G0. It's a slightly modified version of G0. Sorry, I should have mentioned this. So G0 tiled minus 1 is G0 minus 1 shifted by U over 2. So this is almost the non-interacting Green's function, but, uh, but I've just shifted somehow the chemical potential. Uh, and this is the way, the reason why you do this is because you want to conserve particle hole symmetry. So uh, sorry about this. So this is G time. So these are basically the first two diagrams. The heart, I mean, the heart rate term here. And the next term, for those who know, is uh, this other guy here, which looks like this. Okay. So just for those who, knows di who know diagrams, one comment here, actually, and this is the reason why you have to plug this modified version of G0. Actually, if you do the perturbation theory like this with the original G0, you, you lose particle hole symmetry. You will never keep uh, your half filling. Uh, so this is why you actually shift it somehow. Okay? So where do you think this uh, solver is, is good? Uh, I'm doing perturbation theory. So in what regime do you expect this uh, to be OK? For small u, okay? So, of course, for small u, it's working pretty nice. So, the, where do you expect it to work nice at very large u? I'm doing perturbation theory in u, so do you expect large u works nice? In principle, no. Okay, in principle, one wouldn't expect perturbation theory to work. But somehow, by chance, in this particular case, it just happens so uh, that the large u limit is working as well. So you can maybe work it out. So the large lead u, so I take this in the limit of large u. So u very big. So in that case, I essentially have the atomic limit. So the Green's function for the atomic limit is minus 1 half. Okay? So if I compute these terms, I get something which is like u over 2. And then I get something plus u squared over 4 i omega n. Okay. So this is taking this limit here, plugging the atomic Green's function in there. You will see it goes to this limit. Okay. And this is actually exactly the self-energy you get for the atomic limit case. So somehow, by doing perturbation theory in u, I nevertheless get the correct large u uh, answer. So this is somehow an accident, but this is uh, good for us because then somehow I have both low and large u limits that are okay, and whatever is in between might be described okay. So this has been used uh, in the beginning to actually study the mode transition. Yes. No, so that's the so that's the thing where where you have to adjust things. So so when you go away from have feeling, this is somehow what you're trying to adjust. So there are some adjustable parameters that enter your description uh, of the perturbation theory, and you actually tune, tune them in a way to sort of recover this limit correctly. So that's the point. Okay. So I think that also answers uh, the question. Also, suppose I have a broken symmetry state in the past. Uh -huh. Are there ways to do iterative perturbation theory for that? <laughs> I don't know uh, about this. So Yes. Suppose I put a D-wave uh, pairing in the path. Can I treat that? Uh, can I treat the cluster within uh, iterative perturbation theory? 
I mean, you, uh, you can always do second order perturbations here. What, uh, what I don't really know is what happens to the to the to the limit. So uh, there, I'm not completely convinced you can you can fit it so that it works. Come as you. Uh, I, I wouldn't. Uh, one might want to try that, but uh, first of all, if you go away from at half filling, you wouldn't expect superconductivity. If you go away from half filling, then IPT for the impurity already works pretty bad, and you have to do lots of tricks to get it working. If you want to uh, do that for a cluster, I'm pretty sure uh, you, you got stuck at a uh, certain point. Uh, of course, you can actually uh, enter symmetry breaking fields and do the calculation with broken symmetry. That no, no, nobody hinders you from that. Uh, has anybody done that for the, I, I think people must have done it for the IPT in the antiferromagnetic phase, in fact. I could imagine they, yeah. they can, yeah. So that, that's, that's possible, but uh, you might want to trust or not the result. Any other questions? So just maybe to summarize. So of course, this is a very fast method. So the positive things about it is that it fa it's fast. And one other thing, even though here the formalism is written in Matsubara frequencies, given that it's essentially an analytical method, uh, you have no noise in your data, and you can actually do uh, analytical continuation to get data on the real axis. So, so this can give you uh, information on the real axis. Okay, so I would say these are the two uh, positive things about it. IPT. Any other? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't, uh, couldn't hear you. So, like your, I mean, uh, weak Q as well as the strong coupling limit, both are working well. But uh, I mean, is there anything that suggests actually? So, your intermediate Q will also work. Well, I mean, of course, uh, intermediate you, uh, you somehow hope for the best. At least there's no, there's no, nothing is controlled between these two limits. So there's no reason why it would provide uh, the correct answer. So you just hope that it provides a reasonable interpolation. But of course, uh, you can be sure that the, the, the details are not going to be correct. Uh, it, it cannot be so. So of course, there will be corrections to higher order in the perturbation theory, which, which are not going to be captured by APT. But it's, it's maybe more of a way to get an overall picture. And it's, you know, in, for some quantities, so we, if you're not interested in very specific details of the spectral function, for example, but more in just a value for the critical U for the mode transition or things like this, it turns out that this gives quite reasonable uh, values. Okay? But then if it's about asking about for a pseudo gap uh, or things like this, uh, I think it's not going to work. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Where, the, where is the assumption about half filling? So, uh, well, when I wrote this here, uh, in computing my perturbations here, I already used half filling at several different places. So, for example, to get this term here, uh, I use that the one half here is because I'm at half filling. So, usually, if the Hartree term is more like u times the average value of n. So, you could have used one Yeah, yeah. So, I could put something else here. Uh, in principle, and also here, uh, well, the, the formulas are a bit different away from half filling here. But in principle, I can always write my perturbation theory away from half filling. There's no problem, okay? And I, ca I can also expect this to actually work not too bad for small u. The point about this is that it actually, and this is an accident, also works at large u. And this is only true at half filling if I write things. If I do the naive approach in which I would replace the one half by my density here, and I just write the term here. Uh, like I would uh, away from half filling and take the large U limit, I'm not going to get the atomic limit answer in that case. It's a trial and error that establishes that, that this is working for half filling. Exactly. This is, uh, well, you, it's a clever guess, I mean, of course. Uh, um, this does injustice to people like Yamada and Yoshida and Latic Novatic. Uh, who did uh, these things in the 70s with great uh, effort to really understand the perturbation uh, expansion in the single impurity Anderson model. In fact, they studied at half filling the, uh, they studied the perturbation series and, and uh, observed several features that happen at half filling. Uh, also uh, could uh, give an idea how big the convergence radius of uh, the perturbation theory is and so on. So this was studied very well. So the uh, what Michael uh, is just uh, referring to, that you have to shift this th thing and so on. This has been investigated by uh, Slatin and Horvatic with great detail to make things work, actually. So it's not a shrewd guess. It's a, 
it's an understanding of the physics behind it. Sure, sure. And, uh, and uh, actually, there are quite recent works which still address this question of how to modify this so that it works. Actually, André Marie uh, Tremblay is not here anymore, but one of his students just very recently uh, worked on these issues, and we had a talk just the other day about this as well. Any other uh, questions? Okay, so these were two uh, rather simple uh, impurity solvers. They're, they're fast, uh, but of course, they don't give you the, the exact answer. So uh, the main thing I want to talk about now is the uh, continuous time quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. But before I do this, I feel uh, that it would be useful that I introduce Monte Carlo method, I mean, the Monte Carlo method, uh, on a very generic ground. So I'll talk to you about using Monte Carlo to do sums. Uh, but you can completely forget about impurity solvers and uh, anything about the MFT at this stage. So I'll try to keep it quite generic. And then we'll go back to the case of, uh, of the CTQMC uh, applied to the interaction expansion uh, algorithm. So uh, basically, Monte Carlo methods So when you hear Monte Carlo, uh, there, there's application of Monte Carlo methods in, in many different uh, cases in many different things. Most of the time what we mean is, is that at some point there's something statistical uh, hidden in the method. Uh, you're sampling something uh, randomly. So the kind of Monte Carlo I want to talk about is uh, the one that helps you basically doing sums. Okay? So what we want to use Monte Carlo for is use it to compute something which is like a sum over x of p of x f of x. Something like this where P of x is bigger than zero. Okay, there are other Monte Carlo methods uh, that do very different things. You can use Monte Carlo to minimize functions and so on. If uh, if you're in Google and look the fastest way to go from point one and point B, there's actually a Monte Carlo running. But this is not at all what I'm talking about. So I want to find a way to actually compute this kind of sums. So of course, if it were just to do a sum here over a single variable, it wouldn't be really uh, interesting to do anything uh, sophisticated, but what I mean by writing x here is really that x is actually a set of many variables, a1, a2, a3, and so on. So it really starts to be interesting to do Monte Carlo. You'll see when x here is a large number of variables. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Okay? So this is the kind of things you want to do too. By the way, here I wrote the sum like this, but you can always, if you have to sum over x, a function g of x, you can always uh, rewrite it in a form which satisfies this in principle. Okay? So where does the Monte Carlo enter? So what I want to do, because my p of x here is larger than zero, I want to interpret this as a probability distribution for my variable x. Okay? So what I would like to do is generate x's with the probability p of x. Okay? If, I'm if I'm able to do this, if I'm able to generate by some uh, method var variables x that are distributed according to this, then I can say that this sum is more or less the same as 1 over n, sum over n, or sum over, sorry, the xi's that I have here of f of xi. So the xi's here are the variables that I'm generating. The xi's appear with the probability p of x. Okay? So if I generate many of them, I can hope that just summing the f taken on these xi's will actually be something quite close to this. Okay? So when I do this, I, I sort of assume and I hope that getting a small sample uh, of variables is actually give me, giving me a good representation uh, of the problem. Okay? So this is a, an assumption, and it's uh, something which uh, that might be quite robust. Uh, I'll talk about this again. Okay? So the very idea is to do this approximation. Right? But the problem is, uh, I mean, this is a nice idea, but what is not that easy is actually how do I generate sets of x which are actually distributed according to px. Okay? This doesn't seem so obvious. So, You've probably heard of this. Who, who already knows the answer to this question? OK, so I think it's good that I talk about it. So there are different ways to do this, but uh, one of the most common things uh, to do is to generate something which is called a Markov chain. So. so a Markov chain is basically 
what I do, I start with the first given set of variables here, which are called x1. And by doing something, I just modify it a little, or I modify it in a controlled way, and I get an x2. And then I modify it, I get an x4, I mean x3, and so on. Okay, this is a Markov chain, I'll, I'll come in more details here. The point is, I will generate a sequence of variables here which is not completely independent. So my x2 here is not a variable which is independent on x1. This is the point. I mean, the difficulty is to generate sets of xi's which are completely independent. This I wouldn't know how to do. But here, the Markov chain is basically generate variables which do somehow depend on each other. But I'll not do it completely uh, randomly. I will do this in a way that the transition probability, which I call w, x goes to y. So this is the probability that I go from x to y. And this will satisfy a certain number of things. Okay? It will, first of all, I want to interpret it as a probability. So the sum over y of w x goes to of w x goes to y. I want this to be one. Basically, I want the probability. You see, this sum is the probability that I start from x and go to something. Okay, so this has to to be one. This happens all the time. This is one thing. Another thing which is important is ergodicity. So the point about ergodicity means that if I take any two configuration or any, okay, it's, this is jargon, okay? When I talk about variables, I'll often use configuration because many times you'll see that this corresponds to some configuration of a physical system, okay? So uh, when I say configuration, I understand x. Ergodicity means that I can start from any x and go to any other y. If I pick two, there will be a way to go from one to the other. This is essential, okay? And the last thing is the balance condition. So I'll write there, maybe. You see, so far, at some point, the probability that I want to reach has to appear, right? I mean, the goal is to generate things with this probability. So far, it has entered nowhere, so it has to enter at some point. And so the balance condition requires that the sum over x different from y of w x goes to y times p of x is equal to sum x different from y of w y goes to x times p of y. So I require that this probability to go from x to y satisfies this. This is called the balance condition. Okay? There is a weaker form of this, which you'll see and hear about, which is called the detailed balance. So the detailed balance is something which is weaker in the sense that I will just require that omega x goes to y divided by or w y goes to x. This is p of y divided by p of x. So this condition here, I'm sorry? Oh, I couldn't hear you, sorry. In LHS and RHS, uh, what is the sum is over? Yeah, the, ba yeah, the balance equation? Oh, over what variables? So. Here, it's basically, on, in that case, over all y. OK, in that case, yeah, it's, so, so it should go the other way. So uh, let me get this straight. Yeah, here it's over all x. I'm sorry, and error. Yeah, I should have written. This is what you mean, or? Sorry. So you see, this is a weaker, I mean, if this is true, this is certainly true. OK, so this, is, this condition is sufficient, but it's actually not necessary that the weaker I mean, the, this, this is enough. Uh, but if you have this, it's even better, okay? So I've almost, I'm doing better here because I know, okay, I can generate a Markov chain. If I find a W here, which has, or which satisfies this, then I'm pretty much set. But still, I don't know how to do it. Okay, how do I get this transition probability? How do I choose it in a way that it does satisfy this? 
Okay. So uh, there are, again, uh, actually different ways to do this, but the, the one solution to do this is to use uh, the Metropolis algorithm. So you've probably heard uh, this word before. So I'll describe what Metropolis says about this. So Metropolis then is really a way to uh, find this W based on what is called an accept-reject scheme. I'll write it. It's called an accept-reject scheme. Okay. So the idea is I will write this transition probability to go from X to Y as the product of two things. A first term, which is T of X goes to Y, and I'll explain these two terms, times some A of X goes to Y. So the way I'll proceed, and this is why it's called an accept-reject scheme, is that I will propose new variables. Okay, I will start with X, and I'll modify X in a way which I decide, and the way, if, for example, I want to go from X to Y, I completely decide how I want to do this. Okay, I decide I have some strategy which modifies X into some other variable I, and the way I do this, do this is described by this transition probability. So this describes how or what is the probability that using my strategy that I decided, I go from X to Y. Okay? So you're free basically to choose this object. This depends on the strategy you're using. I'll show some, some examples. Okay? But then after I propose this new variable Y, I will actually accept this change with a given probability A x goes to y. Okay, so the key is in this a here, which is about accepting or not what I'm proposing. Okay, so the new y here is accepted with the probability a, x goes to y, which is given by, and this is what Metropolis tells, the minimum between 1 and, and here I'll have to put fractions right, so t y goes to x times p of y divided by t, x goes to y, p of x. So you see it's the probability distribution appears in the acceptance rate, in, the, in this pro probability to actually accept the move. The way you choose this doesn't need to have anything to do with the probability. Exactly. So ergodicity goes into this variable. So you have to make sure that your strategy to go from one configuration to the other, from one variable to the other, uh, is done in a way that you will actually reach everybody. So ergodicity is encoded in this guy, and detail balance is encoded here. I have W X going to Y. Then W Y going to Z. Yes. Can you uh, say that that is equal to W X going to Z? Well, yeah, it's the product of, uh, okay. of the two. This, this is true. Sure, you multiply probabilities, this is always true. So it's the probability on W, this works, okay? W X goes to Z is W X Y, W Y Z, okay? It wouldn't be true just with this. Okay, so far? Good, so we might want to check that the whole thing uh, actually makes sense, so. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, that is not, that's not I'm sorry, 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 sorry. You, you have to sum over all y's. I'm sorry. I, I'm completely sorry about this. So, yeah, what are you trying? I'm sorry. Right, x goes to z. So, it's the, the product, uh, the sum, sorry. Sum over all y, w, x goes to z. Sorry about this. Okay. So let me show you that this actually works now. Uh, I gave you the ingredients, but I haven't really convinced you that, that it does what it should. So let me first check that this, using this accept-reject scheme, I do actually satisfy the detailed balance. 
Okay, so what I want to actually, did, yeah, did, did, it satisfies the detailed balance even in this case. So I want to compute W X goes to Y divided by W Y goes to X. So this, if I just take what I've written here, is T X goes to Y times the acceptance rate, which is the minimum of one, and here. I have to write my different pieces. Ty goes to x, probability of y, divided by Tx goes to y, probability of x, and then I divide by sorry, y goes to x, minimum of again 1, and I have to go the other way, Tx goes to y, T of x, T y goes to x, P of y. Sorry. So is this true? So what is what is this quantity here? So you see that this object here is one over this one. Okay. So there are two possibilities. E either this object is smaller than one. So if this is smaller than one, then the minimum will give me this term. But if this is smaller than 1, then this is bigger than 1. So here I'll have 1. Okay. So in the case when this is smaller than 1, you see I get basically upstairs I get this, which cancels out this with this. This cancels with this. This is 1. So I'm just left with <coughs> P of Y divided by P of X, which is exactly what I wanted. It's my detailed balance. The other possibility would have been that this is larger than 1. In that case, I get 1 here. And downstairs, this is then smaller than 1. So I get this. And again, so it's one of this. So these two cancel, these two cancel. And I'm again left with 1 over this, which is the same thing. Okay. So that does satisfy uh, the detailed balance. Okay. So maybe the last step which I can uh, show is that what I haven't really shown you so far is that actually the Markov chain, by using a W which satisfies the detailed balance, or actually this balance condition, that this actually will, at the end, uh, lead to a probability distribution, which is the one you were look looking for. So I'll try to show uh, that by doing a Markov chain, eventually uh, the stationary probability distribution that you get is actually the one you wanted if uh, your transition probabilities satisfy this. Okay, so this is the last thing I want to show. Are there any questions uh, at that stage? Or? So I'll keep this here for now. The physical interpretation. Uh, huh. Can I give a physical interpretation to the detailed balance? Yeah, I'm not. I don't know if I can really find an easy, easy way to show this. It, uh, you'll you'll see it clearly from the from the from the fact that you impose that the probability st distribution is stationary. Uh, how exactly I understand this physically, I don't quite know. I should have to think about it. Okay. So remember my Markov chain. I start with the next i and I move to different configurations. So I will call <coughs> p small n of x. This is the probability that at the nth step here, I find the configuration x. Okay. So in principle, this probability distribution will change at every step. So I start from, say, a known probability distribution. Then the next one, the next step will be different. Okay. So let's try to compute it. So let's try to compute p at the next step of getting some x here. Okay? So the probability that I'm in x at the step n plus 1 is basically the probability that I started from some y, configuration y, so that I was in a configuration y at the step before this, and that I went from y into x. 
Okay, so that are transferred from y into x. And I do the sum over all y that are different from x. So this, it's not over, there's an extra term. But the first part is basically to say, okay, to reach x, I started from something different. Okay, and the probability to start from something different and to reach x is this. Now the term that is missing is the probability that I actually was in x already in the first place. Okay. And this I'll write as the probability that I was in x. Okay. And to get the probability that I remained in x, I will write it as 1 minus the probability that I did not remain in x. So I'll write it as 1 minus the sum again of all y different from x of the transition from uh, x to y. Okay, this is 1 minus the probability that something happened, something changed. So this is the probability that I remain in x. Okay? So here, the subscript is always n. Okay, with this? So if this converges, okay, and this I will not prove, but, uh, but you can actually show that as you keep on generating things at some point, well, you'll end up with a stationary distribution, which basically means that your p n plus 1 will be equal to p n. Okay, things don't change anymore. I get to a stationary point. So you see in that case, I lose basically this. Okay, this, these are all the same. So I can, p n is the same thing all over. And in that case, you see things cancel out. So this p n, I see here. So these two, they cancel out. Get rid of this one here. I get zero here. And what's left on the blackboard is exactly the balance condition. Okay, sum over y different from x of pn, py is what I have here. Well, actually, what I have here. And this term minus this is what I have here. Okay? So this shows that this is actually the p that I want. Is that clear? So one should in principle also prove that the thing reaches stationarity and, uh, and you can do it but this goes slightly beyond uh, what I wanted to do here. So maybe just to show you an example to make all these uh, ideas uh, clear, what time is it? Yeah, I still have time to, to do something about this. Uh, I'll, I'll show you one example uh, where uh, we can use this kind of uh, Monte Carlo. So I'll take a simple classical physics example. And you know, try to to make something real about these x and y's. And I'll just just look at the Ising 1D chain, okay? <coughs> Classical case. All I'm considering is a chain of spins. Ising spins, either up or down. Okay? And I'll give this uh, an energy which is something which is J sum over i, these are the sides that I'm considering, si times si plus 1. Okay, so I'm favoring, I'll, I'll take j positive, so say I'm, I'm favoring uh, anti-ferromagnetic somehow spins or anti-aligned spins, and I'll put, say, some magnetic field which I couple. This is just an example, it really doesn't uh, matter. Uh, and I couple it to a magnetic field. Say I want to uh, study this problem and say I'm interested in the average magnetization of this system. So I want to compute the average of n. Okay, so if I want to do this in principle from a statistical physics, what I have to do is I have to sum over all configurations, namely over all possible states of the system, which I'll call x, or something which is e to the minus beta energy of this configuration x and then times the magnetization m of x divided by the partition function. Okay. So typically if you were asked to solve this problem, I mean this x is the collection of all these spins. So this is really an x which is s1, s2 and so on. If you take a chain which has a hundred spins, okay, this would in principle mean that I have to do a sum over 2 to the 100 variables. Okay? This is completely impossible to carry out uh, exactly. 
So this is typically an example where a Monte Carlo method is useful. You can, instead of sampling all possible systems, I mean counting them all, you just sample them statistically. So this is exactly one example uh, where I could use this. I want to, okay, so then in, in practice, what does it mean? So it means that I start my Markov chain with some configuration, okay? And I do some changes. Like I said, you're free to decide how you want to propose new configurations, new variables x. So in that case, what I would, for example, do is just pick one spin randomly and flip it, okay? So I would go, this would be my configuration x, and I would go to y by just flipping randomly one spin. So this t x goes to y would just be one over the number of spins, okay, in that case. Very simple choice. And then using the metropolis, I accept or reject this configuration and move on like this, okay? So at some point, uh, I get my probability distribution for these variables, and all I have to do is sample the quantity I'm inter interested in. So I have all these uh, configurations which are generated, and then I measure the magnetization. So here I would get something like plus two and, and so on. I do the average of this number on my distribution, and this gives me the average value of uh, the magnetization, okay? So this for uh, the tutorial next week, actually for those who want to uh, uh, code a little, we, we will do this exercise just for, for fun, okay? A very simple Monte Carlo. One thing which I wanna uh, mention already at that stage is, uh, actually I was telling you that the, the hope somehow that the Monte Carlo works nicely is that what we sample is actually a good set of representatives of the physical system. Okay. Actually, maybe the question, you can also ask it the other way. When I derived statistical physics, I had to assume somehow that my system was in all possible states it can take. And it turns out if you put numbers in typical physical systems, especially in quantum systems, and if you look at the configuration space that the system can actually take, and if you look at how long it would actually take for the system to sample all possible configurations, so that really, uh, statistical physics would be expressed as the sum over all possible states, well, you realize that these times are huge, okay? They're completely not comparable to our human time scales, okay? So actually, it almost goes the other way around. Somehow it's when I wrote statistical physics in that way that I made the assumption that actually a small set uh, of configurations that the physical systems actually take are good representatives of the whole set of systems, okay? So in a certain sense, Monte Carlo, can sometimes be even somehow closer to what really, ha I mean, is happening, okay? It's just a comment, but I think it's good to know. Any questions at, uh, at that stage? I'm sorry? On the writing side, T goes to Y. T goes to Y, yeah. How, no, no, I mean, this is just my choice. So, so this, again, the Tx goes to Y. This is the probability that I generate a configuration Y starting from X. And the way I chose to do this is to just pick one spin randomly and flip it. And the one over N I'm writing here is the probability to pick one specific uh, spin here. Okay. Well, I'm sorry? If they differ by one spin flip, this was the choice I made in that case. So actually it turns out for some systems you would want to do some different things. I mean, this is one possibility is to pick one spin and flip one spin. Some other possibility would be to, ice, to find a barrier and flip all the spins before this barrier, for example. Uh, there are different kind of things you can think of. Actually, you're free to choose how you want to do this, okay? Uh, the key is that it's the acceptance or rejection of, of your move that that satisfies the, the balance condition, okay? So you see, this is a classical system. So in that case, no, I, in that specific case, and it actually happens in uh, several different cases. In that case, these two things are the same here in that specific choice. And T is X going to Y. Oh, no, no, the W, again, the W, 
is T times the acceptance of the move, that you accept or reject the move. And this is given by the minimum of 1 in this ratio. But sum over all W is the 1. What is 1? Sum over all, uh, all Y, uh, sum over X going to Y over Y. Sum over? Ah, w X going to Y, sum over Y is 1. Yes. So I don't find any difference between W and T. No. Well, what will be the expression of W in this case? W and T, no, but I mean, uh, you have the ratio, again, in A, you have the ratio of the probabilities yeah. that appears. But the, these states, they don't have the same local probability, right? The probability is given by... Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, maybe this I didn't yeah. quite mention uh, good enough here. So the probability I want to have here for X is the Boltzmann weight. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention this. So this is what I want to take as a probability. So P of X and P of Y don't have the same energy, and so they don't have the... Right? So, I'm sure you're making a good point here. So, you see, in that classical system, it was quite easy to pick uh, the probability which I want for my configuration. I just picked the Boltzmann weight. This is a very natural choice. Plus, it has this nice thing that it is indeed always positive, so I can uh, interpret it as a, as a probability. Okay? Now, if I switch to the quantum uh, world, and this is where the Q uh, comes in, well, trouble begins, at least for fermionic systems, because... In that case, you might have what's called the sign problem. So let me maybe mention something about the sign problem here. So sign problem. So again, in the classical case, it looks like everything was fine. But in general, I'm not quite sure that when I try to compute some average of f, which is something like sum over x, w of x, function of x, divided by sum. This is typically the kind of average we're computing, right? It's something like 1 over the partition function, say, times something like this. This is typically the kind of things I'm trying to uh, compute. Well, before I said, okay, this is positive, but in principle, it might not always be the case. And actually, when you study quantum systems, and especially fermionic systems, this W of X doesn't need to be positive. Okay? This is not necessarily true. Okay? This doesn't mean that you can't do anything about it. I mean, you can still try to define a probability, but then you have to take the absolute value. You can say P of X then is absolute value of this omega of x. This I can still interpret as a probability. But the problem is that now this thing, I have to rewrite as sum over x, absolute value of omega to make, this is my probability, f of x. And I have an s of x, which is the sign of this. Okay, if I want these two things to be equal, this is the absolute value, I have to correct it by a sign, divided by sum over x, absolute value of omega x, s of x. So now I'm back on tracks. I mean, I'm, I'm back to something which looks like what I want. I can take this as a probability, and I have a way to compute this, right? So this is approximated by, so I'll say it's a Monte Carlo sum, once I've generated my configurations with the good probability, of f of x, s of x, divided by sum Monte Carlo, s of x. So now this is how I will have to compute the average value of f, right? I'll have to accumulate to, in my Markov, series, I mean, terms like f of x times s of x, but especially I'll have to divide eventually by something which is sum of all my configurations which appear of s of x. And here's where trouble begins. If from one configuration to another, this s of x keeps changing, okay, what I get here will be very small, especially with respect to its variance. So it will have large error bars and small average value. So the error bar of this, I mean, formally it's correct. So if I could have, 
you know, an infinite amount of time, eventually, I mean, this does give the, 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 the correct answer. But the problem is, statistically, the error bar will be huge. Okay? So that's where the sign problem that you probably heard uh, several times comes from. And this is something which is quite specific to fermionic quantum systems. Okay? In bosonic systems, there are ways to uh, write things so that you can actually ensure that everything is positive. But for fermions, we don't really have a way, at least for all systems, to find a way to write things with only positive probabilities of weights. And we face this sign problem. Okay. There are cases, thank God, where there's no sign problem. And uh, for example, the algorithm which I'll show today, in its simplest version, doesn't have a sign problem, even though it's a fermionic problem. So it's not a total curse. Uh, there are cases uh, which work OK, but in general, uh, in general, you might uh, see this uh, sign problem somewhere. Are there any questions about, about this? Okay. So let me see with the, with the timing. Yeah, so at that stage, I'll... Uh, during the hands-on session, I'll, I'll show you how one implements this really in practice. Uh, how, how you do a Monte Carlo loop numerically, how uh, to decide when the system is thermalized, and so on. Okay. Uh, I'll skip this now because otherwise I might be a little behind with the timing. Okay, so this closes this parenthesis about Monte Carlo methods. Again, all I've been saying here is quite generally doesn't apply necessarily to these uh, quantum impurity problems. And I think it's useful that you know it. So please, if you have questions, I think this is for anybody really at some point in your life. You'll hear, I mean, you will hear about Monte Carlo. So if you have questions, it's a, it's a good moment to, to ask. The approximation? Yeah, I mean, it's approximation in a statistical sense. So it means that the formula is, is exact uh, in the sense that if I could generate an infinite number of configurations, it would give me the, the correct answer. But, but in principle, I have error bars which are statistical. So this is what I mean by this. It's, it's correct, but it will have error bars. But it's nevertheless, stati we, we call these methods statistically exact. I mean, methods in the sense that they at least should provide the correct answer, but they have error bars, right? And maybe I can say one word about this. Uh, it's more a technical thing, but like I said, we, in these Markov chains, we start from one configuration and generate another one, and so on. So these configurations, there's quite a bit of autocorrelation between them. So they're not very different. They depend one on another. So when it actually goes to actually computing the error bar, this is quite a delicate thing to do because in principle, what we're used to doing is consider that all my samples are completely independent, and this is how you get the error bar. Uh, here, you have to do things which are more subtle, like a jackknife analysis and things like this, which do take into account the fact that these configurations might be uh, correlated one to the other, okay? Uh, yeah, I have a question, actually. So, for, yeah. so, so why we are getting, actually, that probability negative? The WX, actually, you mentioned the Fermion case. I'm sorry, sorry, say, say it again. No, I mean the sign problem that you mentioned. It's essentially sometimes you get while calculating the probability, you are getting its negative, right? Well, I mean, it's not really by calculating the probability, but it's, there are usually natural ways to, to write these kind of things, right? Uh, it's, it's, so, and, and the thing is, quite often you want to use a set, I mean, you generate these variables, okay? And maybe there's not just one thing you want to measure. There are several things. You want to compute the magnetization, but also the average energy or other things and so on. So you, in general, want to, to pick here a formula, a formula which allows to measure many different things. So this sort of sometimes fixes the way this is written. And then there's not that much choice. I mean, then you end up with something here which doesn't necessarily uh, have a positive sign. You don't start with probabilities. For instance, you start with the partition function. So you write the physical problem, and then to, you try to boil it down to a form like this. So you end up with an equation that looks like this, and then you try to find something that looks like a probability. So that's yeah. more the way to go. Yeah. And for, for fermions, you always have determinants. You know, also the Grassmann is because it's fermions, it's not a complex number. So it's a determinant, and the determinant can have a negative sign. That's exactly where it comes from. For instance, the terminal quantum Monte Carlo has exactly this sign problem. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? 
Great. So at that stage, I'll introduce uh, the idea behind this continuous time uh, quantum Monte Carlo method. Okay. So there's C, T cube. So the introduction of these methods, which happened somewhere in 2005, more or less, it, 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 in the field, it has been quite a bit of a revolution. So you have to know that until 2005, more or less, huh, we, the algorithm that was around was called Hirsch 5, which, was, which is also a quantum Monte Carlo methods, uh, method here. Uh, it's not continuous time. I'll explain uh, a little later what, what, what is really this continuous time. Uh, what you have to understand from the, the thing not being continuous in time is that there was some systematic uh, error in this method. So it's a method that is based on the action. And what it basically what it has to do is in the imaginary time interval from zero to beta, it's introducing auxiliary fields somehow to compute uh, an action. So what it, what it is doing, it's discretizing the time interval uh, in a given way. Uh, it would be exact if these bins were infinitely small, but this would lead to very large matrices to handle. So you make a systematic error in this algorithm, uh, basically. So uh, what happened with the introduction of uh, the CTQMC, I think the revolution, one of the main things was mainly that we got rid of this discretization error. Okay? Well, I, may, I don't want to get into the detail. I think I'll confuse you if I tell you too much about the Hirsch file because then uh, you might be confused with the But basically what you want to compute is, uh, the, again, it's always about computing the partition function somehow. In, in the path integral formalism, it's something like this. So uh, the discretization happens. You want to compute this. Okay. And in order to compute this integral, you, you express your action, which is a function. I mean, it's usually an integral over imaginary time. And to do this, you, well, you cut it into pieces and, and, and discretize your uh, interval from zero to beta. But I, I don't want to say too much uh, about this because I don't want to confuse you. What you have to keep I mean, in mind is just that basically there was some systematic error which was introduced. And the CTQMC methods, I mean, they got rid of this. This is one point. And they turned out also. Uh, to be a lot faster. Uh, so, but I, th I think the main thing is that you got rid of the discretization. So of course, uh, this was quite exciting, especially in the field uh, of DMFT, because then we could reach lower temperatures uh, to give you some, I mean, some advantages are we could go to lower temperatures. We could start dealing with systems which, which have more orbitals. We could go to, to five orbitals and even keeping uh, interactions which were not only limited to density density. So the Hirsch phi was, was limited to density density. Thanks to Philip's algorithm, you can take a full SU2 invariant uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, this, these are, this is one thing. We, we, we could do dynamical uh, things. So compute dynamical quantities to a certain extent, even compute things on the, on the real axis. So that really have uh, been quite a bit of a revolution and, uh, and, and uh, there has been a lot of excitement. So they come in, in different flavors. Uh, let me see. There are actually several of these methods. Uh, they're all based on the same principle, which I'll try to explain. But basically, the, the different names of these methods are CT int, CT hybridization, and CT aux. So there are three versions of the continuous time quantum Monte Carlo algorithms. They're slightly different because they sort of come from a different kind of perturbation theories. I'll explain this in more details. Uh, the first one is sort of a perturbation expansion in U. Uh, this one, too, actually. Uh, and this is a more a perturbation expansion around the atomic limit. Okay? So today you'll learn about this one. Uh, and Philip on Friday will uh, talk about this. Okay? Uh, this one later on has been shown to be, at least as far as complexity and things are concerned, equivalent to the first one. Okay? So, so this one will skip. So the, 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 the minds behind all this, just uh, to, be, to be fair here, uh, behind the city in this has mainly been Alexei Ruptsov around 2005. Uh, the city Hib, uh, it's Philippe Berner and Andy Millis. Uh, and this uh, has been Emmanuel Gould, Andy Millis, and Olivier Parcolet uh, mainly. So these are really 
I deserve the credit for this, and I have to say at that stage that I feel a little bad about introducing these methods while uh, Philip, well, he's not here, so. Uh, but, but, I mean, he's really uh, one of the persons that has been really uh, extremely active and, uh, in this field and, and, and has done great things, so uh, he probably should have introduced this, but anyway, uh, you'll hear him uh, later this week. Uh, the reason was mainly that we'll need this maybe in the tutorial, so we, this is why we started with this thing. Okay, so I hope you forgive me for this. So the principle is uh, the same for these uh, three guys, and the idea is to basically write a perturbation expansion for the partition function, and then sample the different terms or, uh, of this perturbation expansion uh, in a statistical way using Monte Carlo. So, there's a bird. Let me explain the principle that is common to all these uh, three algorithms and then we'll take a, a coffee break. So, remember in the Hamiltonian formalism, the, the expression for the partition function is just something like trace of e to the minus eta the Hamiltonian. And as, uh, as Vijay showed you last week, you can also write this using the action uh, formalism, uh, in which case you use a path integral with Grassmann variables, which is c dagger c e to the minus this action. Okay. So these are two ways to compute uh, the partition function. And the methods here are uh, centered around manipulating this. Okay. So uh, I won't use anything with the Hamiltonian. So the key idea is to uh, try to write a perturbation uh, expansion uh, of this object. Basically, the idea is to write the action S as the sum of two pieces, SA plus SB, okay. where SA would be s describing a system that, that I know, that I understand, and that I, that I can solve. Okay. Uh, you will see these ca there can be different choices, but basically the idea is this is something that I know. And this is the perturbation, something which in principle can be, uh, should be small, but which is uh, making the problem complex, okay? So by cutting this into pieces, I can rewrite this partition function here as, again, an integral over Rossmann variables. And I can cut this exponential into two pieces, minus SB, okay? So I use this decoupling. And uh, what I'll do is remember how, with the uh, Grassmann variables and the path uh, integral, how you write average values, okay? Remember, if you want to know the average value of an operator like this, which, which is actually, to be more precise, it should be the time ordering of this thing, you write it as the path integral C dagger C, e to the minus S, and then you put this operator. It's very much like uh, when you write for uh, the partition function in this way, the average value would trace minus beta h sum operator. When in the path integral formalism, it's the same thing, but with the e to the minus s and the operator here. Okay. So you see here, uh, basically this first piece is something which will give me an average value for this second piece. Right. So this I can actually write as the average value of this, well, I'll, I'll do it in two steps, sorry. I'll first do an expansion of this object, sorry. So because this is the perturbation, I'll try to get it at several orders. So I'll, I'll write a Taylor expansion for this, for this guy. So I'll, I'll write this as the integral dc dagger c, my e to the minus sa, and I'll write the exp in its Taylor expansion. So sum over n, one over n factorial, there's a minus one, to the n here and an sv to the power n. Okay, I did nothing, I just rewrote the exponential uh, in its Taylor form. And you see these different terms as, as I take one term to the other, uh, there are different orders in the perturbation because they come with s to the power n. Okay, so these are different things. Okay, so like I said, you see here, I have this first part, it's like what I had here. Okay, this is the operator which appears here. 
Okay? So what I wrote here is actually just the average of this second part in the system which is described by this action S of A. Right? So this I can just write as the average of sum over n minus 1 to the n divided by n factorial as b to the n. And I'll put, a, I'll put an a here to remind you that this average value that I'm taking here is the average value in the system described by the action a. Okay? This is why I told you that the way you decouple this thing in two pieces is a way in which you want to put something here which is a system you, you know. Okay? that you could diagonalize or that is not interacting or something because if you know the system and you can solve it, then you're able to compute this kind of average values. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, exactly. You're completely right, sorry, I forgot it here as well. Yeah, sorry, thanks. Exactly, that's where I multiply by, the, by ZA here, okay? So all these algorithms, they're based on this idea. They're based on the idea that I'll rewrite the partition function as a perturbation series, namely a sum over, sum over different orders of this action as p taken to the power n. Okay? If you look at it like this, it might look like, well, but this is a, quite a simple sum because it's just a sum over n. Okay? So you say, what the hell? I mean, I have one variable and I have to add this stuff, why do I do Monte Carlo on this? Okay. Well, the thing is that usually the expression of this SB, of this part of the action, most of the time is something which itself involves integrals. So it will depend a little bit on the case, but SB is typically something which might involve some integral over imaginary times, maybe several, maybe one, maybe some sum over a spin of some set of operators. Don't look at what I'm writing. I'm just, uh, you know, just for illustration uh, purposes. It might be something like this with other terms here. Okay. The only point I'm trying to make here is that SB itself has its own set of integrals here, okay. uh, among which you can be sure that there will be some integral over imaginary time. Okay. Of course, when you now feed this guy in here to the power n, you get all these sums and n, you get n versions of these sums that come out here, okay? So the sum you have to do is a sum over perturbation order, but most likely it will also be a sum over a whole set of imaginary times, n of spins, and so on, okay? So this is where Monte Carlo is useful because I'll end up as an expansion parameter. So this will be the non-interacting system with u is equal to zero, and this is just the Coulomb term, basically. In the hybridization expansion, Philip will talk about this, we start a here will be for the atomic problem, so it's the problem of just the atom, okay? And what is missing is the hybridization, so it will be an expansion in delta in the hybridization. That's pretty much the difference, uh, but the idea is the same, okay? Exactly. No, there's no cutoff on n. There's no systematic error. They're exact. Statistically, they're exact. They will have error bars. Uh, but no, uh, there is no truncation, no systematic error. Oh, well, well, in the past integral, they do. That's the, the, that's the, the magics of the time ordering. So, so that's, of course, they wouldn't commute in a trace. If I had a trace of h1 and h2 and they don't commute, I couldn't split the exponential. But that's the, and that's the whole power of the past integral, I think, at least in my view, is that Indeed, you, you, this is allowed, okay? And, and what I'm doing here, actually, is nothing but the very starting point of writing Feynman diagrams, actually. I mean, this is just how you would start a lecture on how uh, to do perturbation theory. And then Feynman diagrams would just tell you how to compute these different terms uh, but by having sort of a, uh, by using, first of all, Vick's theorem. I'll come back to this. Vijay, have you mentioned Vick's theorem? No. I'll mention it, but not prove it because, <laughs> you know, but basically uh, b this is really the starting point of, uh, of diagrammatic perturbation theory, if you want. So, uh, for, if I go into the hybridization expansion. Yes. Uh, no, actually the, so the hybridization as, hybridization as A and the B as the interaction. The, wait, that is, that's the interaction expansion. Okay, that's the interaction expansion. So, okay. yeah. 
so not interacting and the uh, UN up and down. So then there is some similarity of this with uh, uh, Prokofiev's uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo sampling? Yes, okay. yeah. So yeah, uh, you, thanks for mentioning because I, I, I wanted to mention this, but I forgot. So all this work on the, on, on the, the interaction expansion and, and these algorithms in, in general, one has to be fair and say that this has actually been work that it was really first started by Prokofiev, Svistinov, uh, in, in, well, almost in 2098. Uh, and, and what they do is they do the same thing, but they do it direct, directly on the full, uh, you know, uh, on the thermodynamic limit. So, so, so they don't just look at, at an impurity, but they take the full system. Uh, actually, they look at it in case space and they write diagrams uh, with, I mean, they get really the exact solution of the model they're, uh, they're looking at, but, but the price they have to pay is that they suffer a much, much worse sign problem. So this is what is killing, uh, killing them. All right, so I think I'm not doing too bad on time. Uh, I think we can take a coffee break and, uh, and relax, and then we'll, we'll switch gears.